who host, maybe that's the best word for this, the ICANN session of cryptography. We have distinguished speakers. This is something that I personally don't know so much about, but I'm definitely looking forward to touch base and, and trying to learn something about this. Welcome to foreigners that have visit coming to Oslo for this event. Welcome to all that have seen this and are here. And we have also, uh, we are streaming this, this has been recorded. So you have to be aware of what you're saying and how you look. You may be caught in an eye uh, boot or something like that. Anyway, again, welcome to Oslo, to ISOC Norway and ICANN. And I give the word to David. He's the man from ICANN, the tall guy from um, ICANN. <laughs> Thank you, Steinar. Hello, everyone. I'm David Huberman from ICANN. And again, on behalf of ICANN and ISOC Norway, thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. It's good to see you here. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation for the next couple of hours talking about cryptography. But what are we talking about? We're talking about four very different things because we hope we you find one or two or three or all four of these things interesting or new or educational. So we're gonna talk for a little bit, but while we're talking, please don't just make us stand up there and talk. If you have questions, if you have comments, if there's something you wanna say, just, just raise your hand or uh, you know, make yourself visible and let's talk. So to kick us off, uh, we're going to talk about quantum. We're gonna talk about quantum computing and cryptography and some of the really interesting things going on. And who better to do that than a government spy? Wait, no, not a government spy, a PhD researcher. Uh, our friend Arne Tobias is here and he is from NSM and is going to talk to us about cryptography, but I'm going to vamp for a little bit because he still doesn't have his microphone on. Yeah. Is this on? There you oh, go. Yes, this. All right, bring your computer on over, Arne Tobias. Just we'll switch this out. There you go. Yes. And... Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I'm here to talk about quantum readiness and also, so two parts, quantum readiness and then high function cryptography. So these are sort of two things we do at NSM. One of them is sort of more directly uh, countering sort of a serious threat to current cryptography. And then the other one is more sort of interesting research for the future. Uh, so just briefly about NSM or the Norwegian National Security Authority. So I have a sort of broad national security focus, um, like preventative security, like all parts of society. Uh, and we don't do intelligence. So we're not like the NSA. We have our own separate organization to do our intelligence. Um, so hopefully you can trust us more than you can trust the NSA. Um, so uh, I have two key points I hope uh, you can take away from today. So the first takeaway uh, in the negative, quantum computers are almost here and they will destroy a lot of the cryptography we rely on today. So we need to migrate to quantum safe cryptography uh, as soon as possible. Ideally five years ago, but hopefully it's yeah, uh, quite soon. Um, and then the second key takeaway, more positive. So there, there is a lot of key cool new cryptography which goes far beyond just encryption uh, to provide very interesting new applications. So I'll start with a, well, just quick definition of what I think of when I hear the word cryptography. It's really about the use of mathematics and computer science to protect information in a sort of general sense. So like most commonly people think of encryption, that's definitely like the core, uh, really a core aspect of cryptography. You have some other things as well. 
so just to refresh people's memory, or uh, hopefully, uh, so symmetric encryption, uh, that's when you two people have uh, want to communicate, uh, but there might be people listening in, but they have a shared key. Uh, this is relatively straightforward and very efficient. Um, then, but you have to have this shared key. If you don't have it, then you have some options. Uh, so you can use public key encryption, where essentially the, the person who wants to receive messages publishes a public key, which anyone can use to encrypt. Um, and then only that person can, uh, who knows the corresponding private key, can decrypt. Uh, also, you can use a key exchange protocol to agree on a shared secret key. Uh, or you can, you know, run around to people physically exchanging keys. If you're doing it on the internet, probably not that, uh, you know, not very reasonable. Um, and then, yeah, finally, dig dig digital signatures, if you want to auth authenticate something. So you, if you want to, you know, sign a contract, uh, but do it digitally, you can't do it in person. Uh, this is really uh, what you use. And there are plenty of other things as well, but these are four key aspects. So quantum computers. Uh, so I'm not going to talk a lot about how quantum computers work. Just very briefly, they operate on qubits instead of bits. So bits in classical computers can be like zero or one. Quantum computers, qubits, like qubits can be sort of a superposition of zero and one. So kind of both at the same time. Like Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead. A qubit is both zero and one uh, kind of thing. And then you manipulate these sort of quantum states or qubits using the principles of quantum mechanics. And then you can compute something quite, quite quickly. Um, so yeah, some problems can, we know of very fast algorithms that run on quantum computers. Uh, and some of them have relevance to cryptography. Uh, now it's unknown precisely which problems quantum computers can solve more quickly. Uh, but we definitely know of some that we think classical computers can't solve quickly. So there are two, uh, two major quantum algorithms for sh cryptography. Shor's algorithm, which can factor large numbers and some other related things. Uh, so this breaks a lot of public key, well, pretty much all public key encryption. So public, yeah, public key encryption and key exchange um, and digital signatures. Most of the existing ones we use today are broken by Shor's algorithm. And then you have Grover's algorithm, where you can uh, essentially search a space uh, like of size n uh, in quad, uh, square root, uh, using only like square root of n uh, number of operations. Uh, so essentially, if you think of searching for the correct key for an encryption system, um, instead of taking two to the you know uh, two to the one hundred and twenty-eight, if one hundred and twenty-eight is your uh, length of your key. You take two to the 64 operations instead. Uh, so to protect, protect against that, essentially what you do is you just double your key lengths. Uh, so you use 256-bit keys and you're safe. Uh, so for a symmetric encryption, quantum computers doesn't have a big impact uh, or are unlikely to have a big impact. Of course, it's possible that people come up with something more clever in the future. So the timeline is that quantum computers are in fact here. Uh, so this is an IBM, I think, 20 qubit quantum computer uh, from, I think, 2019. Uh, yeah, so the current record is 433 qubits, but they're not what we call crypt analytically, crypt analytically relevant yet. So crypt analytically relevant means uh, being able to break encryption, essentially. So you need, it's a bit unclear precisely how many qubits you would need. I think it depends a bit on your modeling and so on, but like tens of thousands of qubits. So we're like not there yet, at least. So what happens in the future? Well, first of all, it's hard to predict. I've seen like lower estimates of like five to 10 years and upper estimates from like 50 years to even never. Uh, if you're very well pessimistic or optimistic, depending on your point of view. Uh, and of course, there's a caveat, secret services could be like far ahead of what's known publicly. So. This current record is what's publicly known uh, by IBM, but it's possible that secret services are ahead of this. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that quantum computers, even if they don't come into existence or are re relevant, 
uh, until like 20 years from now, they could still be a security threat today. Uh, and what we talk about is what we call harvest now and decrypt later. So you can just gather a bunch of encrypted data today and then you store it. And then when you have a quantum computer, you can decrypt it. If you care about storing information for you know, 30 years or more, which we do in the government, then it's actually like it could actually be insecure today. Um, yeah. So yeah, just some of the broken algorithms, pretty much all the common ones that you use on the internet today. But yeah, RSA, Diffie Hellman, DSA, and yeah, elliptic curve versions of these. So where do you go now? So we need new algorithms for public key uh, cryptography. We can't just, uh, well, someone tried to make a post quantum version of RSA uh, and they sort of succeeded, but the keys were like a couple of terabytes. That's not really practical. Uh, so yeah, we need something new that like can resist quantum attacks. Uh, so the US National Institute of Standards and Technology have been running a competition or kind of like a competition uh, where like different algorithms have been like, you know, uh, proposed and, you know, uh, there have been like rounds of analysis and so on. So they've decided to standardize one algorithm for key exchange, uh, it was called Crystal's Kyber, uh, and then these three signature algorithms. Um, so they should, like they have made the decision, preparing all of the documentation for like standardization takes I don't know, about that. Well, it should be done like next year sometime. So it takes a while. And it also will take some time for implementations to mature. People will need to verify them, make sure they're, you know, uh, aren't like vulnerable to various kinds of attacks. And it also can take time to add new cryptography to existing systems, especially if the cryptography is very much entangled with the existing system. Um, it can be quite a challenge. So what should you do if you're responsible for using cryptography uh, in you know, your business? Uh, well, you should get an overview of where you use cryptography. So what information are you protecting and what cryptography are you using to protect it? And yeah, where in your system is it and from which vendors potentially <laughs> do you get cryptogra cryptographic solutions? And think about how vulnerable you are to a quantum computer. So how important is the information you handle? Uh, how long should it be protected for? And who are your adversaries, right? So if your adversaries are nation states, uh, they will likely have access to a quantum computer before, you know, um, economic criminals, for example. Uh, yeah, and then just to sort of general tips, use post-quantum cryptography sooner rather than later uh, and be what we call cryptographically agile. So you know, you want to be able to switch out like cryptography uh, for like new algorithms uh, or change parameters easily. Uh, if, you know, people find out that, yeah, the new algorithms aren't as secure as we hope they were. Uh, you might also want to do what we call hybridation, uh, where you sort of use both a pre-quantum algorithm and the post, which we sort of trust is safe against classical uh, adversaries uh, and a post-quantum algorithm, which we have a bit less faith in. Uh, but if you use both of them, then you sort of get more security that way. Um, so what are we doing about this in NSM? So we've written a detailed guide for the first step. Uh, so just getting an overview. Uh, this is apparently a problem in like parts of the government and so on, which uh, is worrying. Um, so yeah, it's going to be published very soon, um, like next couple of weeks. Uh, and we're going to open a national center for cryptography in October. And the idea is to use this center as a place to you know, teach industry government about, um, yeah, all of this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, at some point, probably when the new NIST standards are available uh, or like finalized, we will recommend new algorithms. Um, and yeah, we will continue to publish advice guidance and recommendations for the next couple of years. Um, that was it for the first part. Are there any questions so far? Hi, thanks. Uh, is the National Center for Cryptography going to be 
uh, for the government only, or no? So, so the idea is to have it be like a um, place of interaction between academia, government, and industry. Oh, cool. Um, okay, great. Photography. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Saul Nielsen. I'm a ISOF Norway member. Um, you say this uh, new organization is for uh, government and business, but uh, there's a lot of software that isn't written by business or government. It's by written by open source volunteers, basically. Is, is this something you guys are thinking of at all? That there is maybe some need for competency building and support to those communities out there? Um, that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure if we've, uh, I'm not sure if we have explicitly talked about it at the moment, but I'll bring it back. It's a good point. Um, yeah, let's talk afterwards. That's a good point. Yes. Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Hobart Moon. Um, you talked about uh, public-private uh, cryptography, but would you say, given that the key exchange is done in a secure way, is um, uh, symmetric cryptography still secure in the quantum, also quantum world? Yes, at least as long as you use sufficiently long keys. Huh? There a question over there, and the question over there. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering uh, one thing about, uh, or at least my expectation from for quantum uh, computers is that uh, even though uh, we're going to have uh, algorithms that are going to, in the number of operations, be quite fast, uh, I'm wondering if, uh, because I expect them to be quite slow in those operations, at least for a long while still. So the the actual computation time uh should we um wh while we absolutely should be worried about it uh would, would they be able to do to decrypt in any reasonable time even though they reduce the number of operations uh yeah yes so uh, well it's good like i didn't explain very thoroughly but so the the grover's algorithm is just like a quadratic speed up um but the shores algorithm is just like it goes from what would take thousands of years on a classical computer to an hour on a quantum computer. So that is sort of uh, like, I think it's reasonable to expect that quantum computers like in not too far in the future would actually be able to break encryption. Yes. A uh, small question about uh, the um, availability of uh, skilled people. A few years ago in Dagens Dagensley, there was an article about uh, how the uh, influx of skilled uh, cryptographers were uh, drying up because they basically needed 10 years of training and uh, the ability to get security clearance and the amount of people with that overlap was diminishing a lot. So they were worried about uh, recruiting people to, to work on cryptography. Is that problem solved now? Uh, I wouldn't say it's solved, uh, but that's why I got like my PhD, actually, like as pretty much a direct consequence of that. Um, so, I mean, there are definitely a, a decent group of new cryptographers being educated like at PhD level in Norway. Um, let's see, how many, about five every year. I mean, that's hopefully not as many as, uh, that's not as many as one would hope, but it's certainly a lot better than it was, like, say, 10 years ago, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Jag heter Jakob Wik. För det första, jag sa inte alltså på vilket årstal blev dessa algoritmer obrukliga? Uh, det är men jag har flera frågor. Eller ta ett om gången och kan du svara på det. Eh. Ja, det huskar jag inte. Eh, sån. Men det var det var en nyckellängd med cirka 50 bits var det inte? Eh, uh, ja, lite mer kanske men sån, ja. Ja, okej, okay, det är inte så viktigt då. Ja. Men vad för det första Hvor sikre er de kryptosystemene som er kommersielt tilgjengelige i dag? Og to, hvilken nøkkellengde anbefaler du som for å være sikker? Er det, er det gradert, eller kan du si? Nei, nei, nei. Uh, nei, man har... Uh, altså, jeg vil si man har stor tillit til de krypteringssystemene man bruker i dag. De har vært i bruk i altså, ja, 
eh, i alla fall de offentliga nycklarna bruk i ja, 40 år minst eh AES har bruk i ja, 25 år, nei, 20 år nu eh, väldigt lite som har varit gjort alltså när det kommer till analys av de algoritmer som tyder på att de har någon säkerhetsfull så er naturligtvis alltså ska aldrig se si aldrig eh, men jag tror mest alltså den kryptografiska eh, akademiska kryptografer har en ganska stor tillit till de algoritmer som man brukar idag. Ja, tillit är er en ting då, men säkerhet är er något helt annat. Ja, men alltså du kan inte bevisa att de är er säkra, så du kan inte göra något mer än att ha tro på det. L- Längden av nyckeln ska jag se nog om hur långt i hur mycket resurser du behöver för att knäcka den eller för att knäcka krypt. Jo, men alltså det fungerar kun så länge algoritmen faktiskt är er trygg nog då. Uh, men alltså de alltså Si, altså, to av de 256 som är er hur mycket du tränger för att knäcka eller hur många operationer cirka du tränger för att knäcka AS med 256 bits nycklar är er ju alltså är er så pass enorm att du måste liksom beräkna med värde av 2 miljoner univers i många år för att få få knäcka det. Jag lurer på när du ska bruka kvantcomputer för att knäcka kryptogrammer då eller decifrera kryptogrammer. Kan du se si någon vilka algoritmer de brukar då? Jag har provat att programmera en kvantcomputer men jag har aldrig grejat att finna ett programmeringsspråk. Eh, uh, jag vet inte så mycket om detaljerna i att programmera en kvantcomputer så eh uh, men alltså det jeg vet är att de tränger på något en eh uh, uh, när jag sa de, bruk, de har liksom en viss mängd qubits. Du tränger något som heter logiska qubits för att programmera med för att programmera dessa algoritmer och då tränger du väldigt många fysiska qubits per qubit eh uh, per logiska qubit så ingen alltså visst du har en fysisk kvantmaskin som kan ta att maskin uppöva och träna algoritmer där eh uh, det du vill klara implementera den för de kvantdatamaskinerna är så pass uh, svag alltså ja, okay, så so, uh, I'm just going to uh, say a little bit to uh, everybody in the room here. Uh, there are quite a few people following us, uh, international people who are following us on the stream. So uh, if we can try, try to speak uh, speak in, uh, I mean, I love Norwegian, but try to speak in uh, in English as much as possible. Um, oh, okay. Hi. <clears throat> I figured I would add, uh, since there seems to be some interest in this, uh, the draft standards for the uh, Kyber algorithm in the dilithium, so the post quantum chem and signature, was released late in August. So you can all go take a look at those if you want to. Hi, uh, I have another question. I didn't introduce myself before, the way I'm Peter Lowe from ICANN. Um, so you said that for symmetric encryption, if you double the length of the keys, then you're basically safe. Yeah. But I guess that quantum uh, computers are going to be getting better over time as well. So are there any forecasts for like how long you'll ha- until we'll have to double them again? Uh, well, the thing is, like, the, there is actually a proof that like quantum computers can't do better in general than Grover's algorithm. So. I mean, of course, there could be that they find someone finds an attack on, say, AES, right? Uh, but that, for example, doesn't have to be quantum specific. So, um, like, you can't actually do better than that square root of n. So, therefore, like, doubling the key length should suffice essentially forever until upon someone finds a vulnerability okay. in AES. Right, forever until yeah. there's a, some other weakness found. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Then the second, uh, well, I think more fun part, uh, high function cryptography. Uh, so like there isn't really a good term for this, but this is what we use. So it's sort of an umbrella term for various cryptographic techniques, which do a lot more than simply encryption and signing. Uh, so these th- techniques can lead to a lot of new applications and hopefully improve privacy and data security. Uh, yeah, these are the three I will talk about today, fully homomorphic encryption, zero knowledge proofs and multi-party computation. Um, so let's just start with the first one. Uh, fully homomorphic encryption, it essentially allows you to compute on encrypted data. So if you have encryptions of some inputs and you have some function, 
you can compute an encryption of function applied to those inputs without learning anything about the underlying data. So importantly, without first decrypting uh, and getting those inputs. Uh, so how could you how could this be applied? Uh, if you want to outsource heavy computations that rely on private data to a cloud service, for example, some sort of business analytics that depend on some business secrets, uh, or running tests, uh, be they health or financial or many, many other things on private data. Um, so yeah, just to uh, expand a bit on the second point, um, just, you know, suppose that you, like, there is a company that's developed a test for a certain type of cancer, uh, which relies on a lot of, like, um, medical data about the person. So medical history, maybe a DNA profile, uh, yeah, various things, uh, that, that you might not want to reveal that to this company, right? So what you can instead do Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, you can encrypt uh, the like your health data, send it to the company. Hmm. Ah, okay, yeah, uh, you can encrypt your uh, health data, send it to a company. They can then run the evaluation, uh, run the test without learning anything about your health data, and you can get the response back decrypted yourself. Um, uh, yeah, decrypt it yourself and learn the value, learn the result of the test, essentially. What's the status of this? Quite inefficient in general. Uh, and like a lot, it very much depends on the structure of the function f. So if it's just a simple average, that's quite, that's fine. Uh, but if it's pretty much anything more complicated than that, it's quite, it will take a long time. Too much to be actually usable. Um, but, you know, they're improving quite fast, uh, hopefully in, I don't know, again, like quantum computers, hard to predict, somewhere between 5, 10, 50, or never, uh, they will be um, more, it will be something that you can actually use. Then zero knowledge proofs, uh, which is what I've been working on most. Uh, so zero knowledge proofs let you prove that a statement is true without revealing why it is true. So you have some sort of public statement that re can rely on some sort of public information. Could be like, I have access to this account. Private information could be my password. Uh, so you can prove that the statement is true without revealing, for example, your password. So they provide privacy to the user and integrity to, well, they provide privacy to one individual and they provide integrity to another individual. So the user can one of the parties can be uh, sure that like their secret information is not leaked, but the other user can be sure that the secret like that secret information exists and is known by the by the other user uh, or by the first user. So just some examples examples of statements and why they're true. So if you have a partially filled in Sudoku, you might a statement might be this is a valid puzzle. Uh, and then why it is true could be like just a solution to the puzzle, but revealing that might, you know, destroy the glee of solving the puzzle. Uh, so you don't want to do that. Instead, you can use a zero knowledge proof to uh, convince someone that the Sudoku does indeed have a solution without revealing anything about that solution. Uh, also, like my business fulfills regulations X, Y, and C because of you know, my business secrets or whatever. Uh, which you might not want to reveal, or in an ideal world, you don't want to reveal to the regulators. Um, also, yeah, the I am the owner of my account because this is my password. So here are some applications. Uh, yeah, uh, proofs of exploit, I think, is very nice. Um, this is a case where you can prove that you found exploit in some piece of software um, without revealing what precisely that you know exploit is. So say it is... Um, uh, yeah, the example they use in their paper is like Heartbleed in OpenSSL. You found that, but you don't want to just like reveal that to the world uh, because it could immediately be used by, you know, to like 
um, break into bank accounts, for example. So what you can what you can instead do is that you compute this zero knowledge proof. Uh, you upload that. Everyone can see. Okay, there is a, you know, there is a bug in this piece of software, and then everyone can stop using that or migrate to some other solution. Um, I mean, of course, in the ideal world, the software render would patch it, or the open source project would patch it. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then this could be an alternative to uploading everything uh, online. Privacy in cryptocurrencies. Um, Essentially, like the way Bitcoin essentially works is that you just uh, upload uh, the identity of the sender and the receiver and the amount they send. Uh, and so everyone can essentially track every transaction in Bitcoin. Um, and if you want to add privacy to that, what you might want to do is encrypt the identities of the sender and the recipient and the amount that's being sent. But then those blobs kind of look just random. So you want to ensure that it re represents a valid transaction uh, and then you use zero knowledge proofs. So this is used in a protocol called Ccash. Uh, so um, yeah, you have privacy preserving single sign-on. If you use a website and you sign on using Google, um, then Google knows which websites you signed in on. Um, using this, you can, well, which isn't, I don't think it's an actual product you can use, to be fair. But using the ideas of this paper, you would be able to have a single sign-on provider, which wouldn't learn anything about the websites you use. Also, just verifiable machine learning, since that's a hot topic these days. Um, suppose that you use a machine learning like service of some kind, um, and you get a like result back. Um, how do you know that that's actually the result of them running their machine learning algorithm and not just some random value. You know, that would save them a lot of computing power. Um, so using this, you can like verify that the result you get was actually applied by running their algorithm. And just in general, you can use similar ideas to verify any computation quickly. So you can outsource a big computation to some other party and you can get a proof back which demonstrates that they actually computed what they said they were going to compute and not just giving you back the answer one, for example. What's the status of this? So it is quite usable in practice. So this privacy and cryptocurrencies example is actually used in practice, like I said. But it typically requires the manual expertise. You Going from what you're trying to prove, you need to translate that into some mathematics. That's a bit tricky. Um, there is a lot of room for improved efficiency. And again, Efficiency depends on the precise thing you're trying to prove. Uh, and then uh, multi-party computation. Uh, the well, uh, third thing I'm going to talk about. The case here is that n parties have their own secret inputs, and then MPC or multi-party computation lets them compute a function of those inputs without revealing their secrets. This could, for example, be an auction. So their inputs could be their bids and an identity. And the function then picks the uh, picks the highest bid and the highest bidder. Money laundering when bank banks legally can't share the data due to privacy laws like GDPR. We sort of want to track uh, or sort of check lots of bank, bank transactions for a suspicious activity, but you know banks can't collaborate. They can have their own database run a like money laundering uh, check um, like together. No one else learns any other data, but they can sort of flag yeah, these accounts are suspicious kinds of things. Also, which I think is very nice and like could be very helpful for just computer security in general. You can split the cryptographic key among multiple parties, and then you can come use multi-party computation to compute with this key, be it like decrypting or signing something or encrypting something. Um, but you never have to have the key in one place. And if you want to like get the key, you need to hack multiple parties instead of just one. That could increase like um, like the increase the capabilities needed by an attacker, essentially. What's the status of this? Quite applicable indeed, especially there are certain special cases, uh, like depending on what this F is, where it's very efficient. Uh, but yeah, again, efficiency very much depends on F. Uh, I think in general it's still a way to go. 
Um, and one special case of multi-party computation, which I like is private aggregation, where you can compute aggregate statistics without learning anything else about the underlying data. So this is essentially the, uh, the previous case where the, like the function f you're trying to compute is some sort of statistics function. Say, for example, an average or I don't know, some machine learning model you're training or something. Um, yeah, it's currently used in practice, but again, performance varies. Um, so yeah, just in general, the main application is statistics while respect respecting privacy. I think like Facebook has been working on ki these kinds of things. Maybe not statistics, more predictions for which ads to serve. Uh, computing update steps in machine learning. This has been used for, so like uh, keyboard on Android phones uh, uses precisely this to do what's called federated learning and uh, to compute usage statistics in the COVID tracking app developed by Apple and Google during COVID. Um, um, yes, so yeah, particularly these last two are actually used in practice today. Um, so why do we care about this? Why not just use like, why not just send all your information to a third party and have them do all the functionality for you? Um, well, the main reason why is that trusted doesn't just mean honest, it means honest and also competent. Uh, so you need to actually be like able to protect the data against, you know, for example, hacks, uh, well, mainly hacks, uh, but also in unintentional data leaks, which is a lot more difficult to do uh, than just being honest. Um, yeah, so my slogan for this kind of thing is trust mathematics, not human competence. Uh, but yeah, of course, caveat, you need to trust the implementation, uh, which someone else will come back to later. Um, but it's typically, so in the case of fully homomorphic encryption, you just need to trust that, like the encryption algorithm, essentially. You don't need to trust that the, anything about the server. Uh, so I think this can help reduce trust uh, or reduce the trust you need um, in various parts of the system. Yeah, less unencrypted data around in general, right? If no one is computing on unencrypted data, like you can't leak unencrypted data, that's in general good. Uh, yeah, less vulnerable to data leaks and yeah, used to reduce reliance on the human factor. So if you have like a key that's split among, you know, four parties, you need to hack, you know, some multiple of those parties, you can't just hack one of them. So it doesn't help that one of them has a ridiculously weak password. You need several of them to have you know, a ridiculously weak password or some other avenue of attack. Uh, yeah, so what are we doing about this in NSM? Not much uh, at the moment. Uh, recently, we started the research project. Uh, we're working on a guide that's going to be public to these technologies and what they can do. And yeah, plan to collaborate with relevant parties, parties in both industry and government at the moment. And we can talk uh, if you have uh, ideas about open source work as well. Uh, I think... That was it. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Any final questions? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Arne Tobias. That was wonderful. Do not forget the most important part. Do you have a good point? Ah. A gift for you. Good job. All right. Uh, I promised you we're going to do four very different presentations. So we're going to do our next presentation on dealing with automated key rollovers. And the application of this is going to be in DNSSEC. To do so, uh, I'm very privileged to introduce my friend, uh, Lars Johan Lehmann. Uh, who uh, is from uh, coming to us today from Stockholm, uh, who works for NetNode. One of the most important systems on the entire internet that most people don't know about is this thing called the root server system. And the root server system 
is what enables all of DNS, everything that everybody uses on the internet every day, to work. The system is uh, 1988, so it's about 35 years old. For most of those 35 years, this esteemed gentleman has run the root server uh, here in uh, Scandinavia uh, called Elroot. Iroot. Iroot. Yeah, no, I'm Elroot. Yes. Oh, yes. No, funny. Yes. <laughs> he runs Iroot. Um, so this is Liman, and we're going to talk about automated key rollovers in the DNS. Uh, so thank you so much. Does this microphone work well? Now I keep talking so that sound people can can hear and adjust properly. Let's try this. Is this better? Okay, thank you. So my name is Lars Johan Lehmann. I work as as introduced in, for a small company in Stockholm called Netnode, um, and I've been working with the DNS for uh, yeah way 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 too long. Um, someone asked me in my early days, so I, you know, just thinking out loud. I wonder if you can make a career out of just working with the DNS. I can tell you, you can. Um, so. Um, What's Netnode? Uh, Netnode is a small company. It's actually a spin-off from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, the Technical University. And um, we have been providing authoritative DNS, meaning the, the provider side of the domain name system um, uh, for uh, since 1998, essentially. Uh, and um, in doing so, we provide service to a good number of enterprises, organizations, companies, and private people. Um, through our systems. Uh, we don't interact with them directly because we have partners that, that have the customer interaction. Uh, we also serve about 80 top level domains. Uh, .no for Norway is, is one of them and .se for Sweden as well uh, and another 70 odd ones. Uh, so um, uh, that's another major part of our business. But we also serve, as David mentioned, we serve the root, the highest level in the DNS tree, which will direct you to the various servers for the national countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, whatnot, but also for the other top level domains, the generic ones, the com, net, org, museum, bank, whatever. Uh, and on top of that is the root service and the, the, the root zone that, that we provision from, from these, that we provide access to from these servers. Uh, we have one of the biggest DNS Anycast systems in the world. We have around 85 locations on the globe where we provide this service, and in total it's more than 400 servers providing DNS service. So we respond to uh, several billion queries per day. Uh, we have two other business legs as well, um, internet exchange points uh, in Sweden mostly. Uh, we have uh, exchange points for internet traffic. We actually do cooperate with Nix here in Norway uh, to provide service in Oslo. And um, we also have our most recent business leg, which is to provide very precise time and frequency services. So you can, by, by connecting to our atomic clocks, you can have down to a microsecond precision in, in, uh, in timing if you want to. We also do a lot of work for uh, global coordination of internet stuff, and and we're involved in in some good general good for the internet stuff, like coming here and presenting. So, um, I will take you on a journey into uh, how how uh, how crypto is used in in DNS, and it's actually these days it's mostly for doing authentication. Um, but I will start actually in my early days in 1984. I did my military service as a crypto assistant. Would you believe it? Uh, and uh, uh, we were taught to master 12 different uh, different ways of doing uh, cryptography and, and encryption. I never, I was never into the, you know, the actual mathematics, but to handle the machines to do this. And we were taught to be able to handle all kinds of messages, whether, you know, carried by couriers or telephone calls or radio or telegraphy or teletypewriter, much of it was teletypewriters, fax, email, early versions of that and whatnot. And in spoken form, in written form, in typed form, punch tapes, whatnot. If it landed, it was encrypted, we were supposed to handle it. And, and uh, we did so to a reasonable um, uh, level. But they all have keys and that's what's going to be the focus of my, my talk here. Because the crypto keys, uh, how to be replaced on a regular basis. The, the more you expose a key by using it, uh, the more data will be encrypted by that key and um, um, 
the more data the your your uh, opponent has access to the more the easier it will be for them to uh, to uh, break your system so you have to replace the keys on a regular basis uh, and uh, uh, that means that you have to have a system to distribute these keys how do you do that in old days well you could stack them up beforehand and you know take a bunch with you when you went on a, on a run somewhere if you were a submarine you had to do that uh, or you could distribute them using a co courier because back in the day these were actual things that you, you had access to and this system of of key distribution is actually a sore point or a point of vulnerability for most crypto systems. If you can't distribute your keys properly, you can eventually no longer encrypt things. And that means that that, that your system stops. So uh, this is actually a picture of the very first crypto machine I laid my eyes on. Uh, this is a crypto machine 301, uh, the, the Swedish version of it. You can see, if you look really carefully, you can see the three crowns down here. Uh, that tells you this was government property. Um, uh, and uh, this one is placed next to, not connected to, it's next to a, uh, a, a shortwave radio uh, of World War II um, <laughs> vintage. This is actually built more recently, but according to old specifications. Uh, and uh, on the right, you see the inner keys, which have to re be replaced on a regular basis, uh, and in this case, daily. Um, so these little punched paper cards needed to be replaced uh, every day. I can tell you stories over beer about not how not to do that. Or slightly more recent machinery would actually use standard IBM punch cards, um, not as you would use them in, in a computer, but uh, it, it was actually the same piece of equipment. I didn't realize that until much later that I had held in my hand these, these IBM cards during my military service. So how is it used in the, in the DNS? Well, DNSSEC, Secure DNS, is used for confidentiality. Uh, sorry, not used for confidentiality. We are not hiding the content. We just to make sure, want to make sure that the correct content is reaching the user and that the user is able to validate, verify that uh, the the uh, author is the 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 per person or entity who claims to be the author, author, and that it hasn't been modified in transit, so that you actually get what the other side sent towards you. There is a, a fourth. Thing you can use signatures for, uh, but that's not used in DNSSEC and that's non-repudiation where you make it possible to, to ensure that the sending party cannot take back what they, what they said. If someone promises something in a message, you can, you can prove that they actually did say that at that point in time. So uh, this is uh, my uh, caveat. Uh, we are not going to do the full training course on DNSSEC. That's a three-day event, including training uh, with computers. Um, DNSSEC is full of infested with um, serious and nasty dragons. So this will be a quick overview where we'll talk about uh, some principles. So these are not the actual details of how it works, but these are you know, fragments and pieces of how things fit together. So signatures, what are they? That took me a while to figure out. Uh, what they are, are are actually encrypted checksums. A checksum is some you can calculate uh, uh, a checksum by using a, a fixed and well-known algorithm and a piece of data. And when you do the calculation, you end up with a number that can be longer or shorter depending on your algorithm. And if you have the same data, the algorithm will always give the same output. And now the theory is that if you change anything, even the smallest bit in the input data, the checksum will come out different. Uh, there is always a risk for collisions that two different pieces of data uh, actually give the same checksum, but with modern algorithms, that's supposed to be extremely rare. So you should be able to trust it and not something you can predict. You cannot construct a new set of data that generates the same checksum. So. Uh, what you do is that you then encrypt the checksum, and that generates the signature. And, and in this, you use uh, asymmetric encryption that, that um, was spoken about earlier. So where, um, uh, sorry, you don't have to do that. Um, that's, that's the common way of doing it. But you send the signature, 
and you send the data. You don't have to send it in the same way. You just have to make sure that the, the recipient is able to understand that this signature belongs to this data. So if it, one comes in paper and one on, on a punch tape, just make sure that you can understand that they belong to each other. And then the recipient calculates the same, same algorithm checksum over the received data, and then it decrypts the checksum that you have sent with the data. And if they match, you have the same data as the author sent. And you can also be sure that it was actually the author who sent the data, or at least created the checksum. Uh, because if it wasn't, then the decryption wouldn't have worked with the crypto key. So this is the process in in a old picture I tried to, to draw many years ago. Uh, that's still kind of valid. Here I have as examples old algorithms. The the uh, Samir Adelman uh, algorithm. Next is a secure hash algorithm, and this 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 the um, RSA encryption algorithm. So you first calculate the hash, you get the checksum, you encrypt that using the private key, you get the signature, and you you send that with your with your information. Okay, now we step into DNS land. Uh, in DNSSEC, everything is encrypted. In DNS, we have DNS records, which pertain to different types of information. We have always a domain name. Uh, the technical term is a resource record name. And to that, we connect some type of information, here an address, meaning an IPv4 address. And then we have the actual data that we want to store or convey in the DNS system. And in DNSSEC, we sign everything in our zone. The zone is the administrative delimited part of the DNS tree in the world that we administer. So uh, my zone, I can sign my zone uh, without bothering about anyone else uh, in you know, other parts of the world, except my parent, the one from which I have received my delegation. Uh, for netnode.se, that would be the SC, the parent would be SC for Sweden. So we add a signature record to this one. This is the signature. And you will note that this is, excuse me, uh, this is a lot bigger than the, the data record itself. The data record is only a few bytes, 10-ish, uh, where the, the signature is uh, on the order of, well, many dozens, maybe 100 bytes. So the amount of DNS data that we get to deal with grows dramatically when we go with DNSSEC. Uh, this is a resource record signature uh, over the address record. So you can see that they are, they are tied together. They have the same name on the left-hand side, meaning these two belong together. And this is the signature over the address record. And then we have the actual signature down here, which is a text representation of the encrypted checksum. Okay. Now, how does the recipient get the key that it needs to validate this? In order to validate properly, it needs to decrypt the data blob at the bottom using a crypto key. So, how does that happen? Well, to begin with, we use asymmetric encryption, where we have two keys in a pair, and they, they go together. So uh, if you encrypt something with one key, you decrypt it with the other key. And you can actually go the other way around. If you decrypt the second key, you can, sorry, if you encrypt with the second key, you can decrypt with the first key. But here we use it only in one direction. Uh, and what we do is we create the signature by calculating the checksum and using the secret key, the first key. Uh, and that's a key that I hold on to and I don't share it with anyone. And then I publish the public key widely so that anyone who wants to can get access to it. Um, that means that anyone can use the key to decrypt something that I have encrypted with my key. And anyone can then validate anything that I have encrypted with my private key. So how do I publish the key? Well, 
in 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 the on the internet everything the the answer to that question is always use the dns that's the you know the kitchen sink that's used for everything so we have to tell the user which key to use in order to decrypt the signature properly and we do that in the same record this is the same one as before but i now point out that this is actually the name of a key you have to look up this this name in the dns and you can have multiple keys with the same names. You have to identify the key using something called the key ID, which is again, actually just a quick checksum of the key. Um, so there is a corresponding DNS key record in the DNS, uh, which is essentially just a big uh, random number, again, represented in text form, uh, but it has a, a few uh, flags uh, uh, in the record just to identify the type of algorithm this key is supposed to be used for and, and a few other things. Okay, are we done now? We can sign, we have, we have published the keys, anyone can validate. Well, we have to make sure that the key that I publish in my DNS server reaches you unaffected and, and as you know, that's a whole key that hasn't been modified. So we have to make sure that the key wasn't altered in transitioning the internet. Well, we use the same method, of course. We add a signature to the key. All right. Who gets to sign the key? Um, well, I do. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, but do you trust me then? Then anyone could use my name to sign the key or in NetNode's name. Uh, so why should you trust me? Um, so this again turns into a problem. So keys in DNSSEC uh, are built into a trust chain. Uh, and uh, the DNS is hierarchical. We have a top level at the root. We have the top level domains. No, SE, Comnet, Org, and then we have various names and organizations underneath. You would have KTH.se, Netno.se, Volvo.se, and you would have uh, names in in, uh, in Norway, the University of Oslo, and uh, what else in in Norway, and uh, Comnet, and so on. And we create a chain where the parent signs the keys of the child. So, I promise you that this is my key, but also my parent promises that this is my key. And if you trust my parent, the Swedish top level domain, you can say, okay, they, they, they promise that this is this is NetNode's key, and then I can choose, it's this choice, I can choose to trust that key as well. Then we have created the first step in the chain. And then you have, on top of that, you have the root that will sign the .se key, it will sign the key for the Swedish top level domain and corresponding for the Norwegian one and for the common net and org. So we create this trust chain, but we have to have a starting point. We must trust something intrinsically. We must trust something from the start. And the DNS sec system is built such that we decide to, to trust the key for the root. Uh, so the root key is your trust anchor, this, that's where it all starts. And by using that key, you can validate the key for .se, you can validate the key for .no. And with the SE key, you can validate the key for netno.se and the key for the University of, of Oslo. And so further down, step by step. That key is available here. This is the true actual uh, place to go and fake, uh, to fetch that key. and. It's also supposed to be so well known that it's you know it's impossible within quotes to fake it. If I were to ask you what number, what telephone number would you call to if you have to alert the fire service? And again, it's your mother. <laughs> okay, one one three it is. So if I was here to say that no, it's two five eight today. <laughs> if I were to say it's 258 today, would you believe me? No, you wouldn't. I hope you wouldn't. So 
that's a well-known telephone number and the key would be so to speak equally well known that if someone comes and tells you this is the root key this day you would say no 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 i pick one my key from here that's the true one uh, so it's supposed to be well known and therefore very hard to fake so in the dns name hierarchy we have the root usually denoted by just a dot uh, and uh, it has a well-known key and that key will then sign the keys of the next level in the tree, and that will sign further down the tree. So, are we done now? Do we have all the bits and pieces? We have a root key. We can access the keys for the top level domains, and using those keys, we can access the keys of the lower second level domains, netnode and, and uh, dnsnode.net in this example. We can actually validate all the things and with those keys we can validate the signatures for the address records and whatnot so we are actually done aren't we well sorry not quite how does the parent know which key to sign how does the parent know that i'm responsible for the key for net node and how does it validate the key when it puts the signature on it uh, that has to happen without a band communication. We can't use the DNS to create that trust. We have to use some other method. Uh, typically, this will be a, a web system where you log into something or you create a business association, you pay for your domain, something you do over the web or talking to your registrar for the domain names who have a, an access to the registry uh, using often EPP, the extensible provisioning protocol that they use to, you know, inject stuff into the top level domain database. We don't use the DNS for this. And that <clears throat> has to happen. But if we do that, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the process for doing that, child ren yeah, it's a key, publishes in the DNS, we then upload the key using this out of band mechanism to the, the parent. And again, this goes for every pair of levels. This is how it works when .se generates a key and, and submits it to the root, or when the KTH creates a key to, to submit it to .se and so on. Once it's uploaded and validated using this separate method, the parent can sign it and publish it. So this is used uh, calling, uh, you, you, this, is, you, this is done using a, a, a record type called DS, Delegation Signer. Uh, and this record is of course in turn signed by someone. And note here, this is actually a, something that's slightly different from the last picture that looked like this. In this case, the netno.se record is signed by the top level domain key. In the last picture I showed, we had the netno.se name signed by netnode. Now it's signed by the someone above in the system. So what happens here is that the Swedish top level domain signs delegation signer information. This, this points out which key we want to use at netnode. So they, the, the Swedish top level domain promises that this key identity with this name is something that is something that we guarantee and you should trust that this key is used for this domain name and everything underneath until further delegations happen. And we, as the top level domain, we guarantee this with our signature. So when you traverse the DNS tree, you will get these records and you can validate where the Swedish top level domain says, for netnode.sc, use the key with the netnode.sc name and this uh, uh, key identity. Uh, and the checksum of the key, by the way, should be this, this uh, number here. This is a checksum of the actual key that netnode has submitted to the parent. Okay. So now we are done, Audrey. We actually have a method of submitting the key to the parent and have it all signed. But nah, we need to rotate these keys. The system is kind of done, but we can't have a fixed system that's cast in stone. We have to rotate the keys. 
So we have to repeat this procedure of going to generating a new key, publishing it, going to where the parent, have it signed, and they published the signature that we saw on the last page. But we're humans. Uh, this is boring. We don't want to do that. Uh, and to be quite honest, we're not very good at it. Humans don't do repetitive tasks very well. Computers are perfect for that. Humans are not. That's one of the reasons that we have computers. Uh, so we want to automate this. And preferably, we also want to stay within the DNS system. We don't have, want to create chains of, of dependencies where we depend on systems outside the DNS to rotate keys that are all inside the DNS. We don't want to use HTTPS with login procedures and whatnot. We have everything inside the DNS. Let's try to stay there. So um, CDS records were invented. Um, that's actually a standard standard thing. Every problem in the DNS is solved by, by uh, inventing a new record type. There's more truth to that than you would believe. Uh, so CDS records uh, were, were introduced. These are child delegation signers. If I back up one slide here, uh, or two slides, uh, we have the DS record. This is stored with a parent. The parent holds on to this record. So the DS record for netnode actually sits in the .sc zone uh, together with the signature of that record. The same thing goes for NS records for, for the actual name server delegation. So there are a few records that are located in the, actually the wrong spot, but it has to be there in order to create the connections between the different uh, levels in the tree. So, uh, uh, the CDS record, on the other hand, is actually stored at the child level and it's child delegation signer. And that's actually the child saying, this is what I want my DS record to be up there. But I cannot influence what's in that zone except by going to them and doing this out of band handshaking and whatnot. But, oh boy, I really want them to publish this. Um, so how, if I put that in my zone, in the net node zone, how does the parent notice that? Well, the first approach to that is by scanning. The Swedish top level domain knows exactly which subdomains it has. It knows that net node is one, it knows that lima.se is another one, and it can actually walk through them all and say, do you have a CDS record? Yes, you do. Okay, uh, I, will, I will process that. Do you have one? No, you don't. Do you have one? Oh, that's the same one as last week. Uh, do you have one? Oh, you don't. Okay, so by scanning all the subdomains, you can actually, you know, pick out the ones that have these records in there and, uh, uh, and then validate them. And, and if you want to, you can publish them as a new version of the DS record on the upper level. But scanning. Uh, scanners are inefficient. They will look at a lot of domains that haven't changed. That's not really efficient. They're also slow. It will take a day or so to scan the Swedish top level domain. It's more than 1 million subdomains that you have to look at to each and every one. You have to ask DNS queries to see if there are any changes and you have to store the information and compare it to what you already have from last week and whatnot. So it's slow. And it's actually a rather complex piece of software as well to do, you know, just to handle all this. So no, that's, that's, that's where we are today. It, the Swedish top level domain is actually scanned uh, on, on a daily basis for these CDS records. Um, I don't believe that Norway does it yet, but I'm very, very fussy on that. Uh, Switzerland does too, I believe. But what if the child could say, I just introduced the CDS record, please look it up now. Uh, so that would be uh, very useful because we could avoid the entire scanning process. Uh, we could ditch the entire scanner software piece of monster thing that we don't want to, to you know, support and, and feed. Uh, and it would all be so much quicker. Hey, I have a new CDS record. Oh, I'll check that immediately. Oh, it's done. Okay, published, done. So 
we could speed up things. So instead of having a polling system, as the computer scientists called it, I got to an interrupt-driven one, uh, which is much, much more efficient and much quicker. In the DNS, we have something called notify messages, which are sent typically from a primary server to a secondary server. You have multiple servers that hold your zone, and the primary can tell the secondary, it's time to do an update. I have new data, please copy. Uh, but what if you could use it for other purposes as well? So this is an idea where the child can send notifications to the parent, but it has to know where the parent is because in the DNS, all pointers go downwards. You know where the root servers are because that's your starting point. But from that, there are only pointers downwards in the tree. Uh, so here we create something where the parent, .se in my examples, can publish information to say, if you want to send notify messages regarding CDS, child delegation signer, to me, please send them to port 5359 on this host. And we will receive your notification message and act on it appropriately. That's the trigger for the interrupt uh, thing that uh, causes the parent to turn the crank and say, "Look up the uh, the uh, uh, look up the CDS record in the child." The notification message will, of course, contain the name of the child. Uh, it will look up uh, the CDS record in the child. It will validate that it's okay, and it can then choose to publish that new record as a DS record on the top. And by adding a CDS record in the child for a new key, sending the notification, turn the crank in the parent, pick up and publish, you can actually rotate the key. So this is where discussions are today. This is not in operation yet. This is being proposed in a, you see, this is, uh, uh, so it's called internet draft. Um, so this is the precursor of an RFC document, the request for comments that, that uh, govern the DNS protocols. This is a proposed mechanism that is about to be handled in the DNS operations working group in the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. It's, it's, uh, the question is out for adoption. It's looking good. Uh, so this is where discussions are going on. And uh, now we can automate the entire process. I just went through that. Uh, and by this, we are actually finally done. So this now all happens inside the DNS. Uh, data is properly validated because everything is signed. The CDS record is, of course, signed by the child so that the parent can validate it. Uh, it happens in a timely fashion because it's interrupt-driven now. We don't have the master scanner involved, and it's all automated. So this is actually all good. This works. Um, but work continues. Um, we weren't quite uh, satisfied with this still. Uh, so my my really old friend and former colleague, Johan Stenstam from, from Internet Stiftels and the .se administrators, uh, just presented at a symposium, the ICANN symposium, and the NES symposium in, in Vietnam. Was it last week? Yep. Uh, a new idea where to use something called dynamic updates instead, where the child can actually send the update in an authenticated way to the parent, and the parent doesn't even have to go through the process of picking up, validating, and whatnot, because you have created beforehand, there's something you have to set up beforehand, you create a secure channel to the parent, uh, where you can send an signed message to the parent saying, please update my DS record immediately. So that's even quicker. And that's actually something that already works if you set it up the right way. The problem is this distribution of keys because um, the traditional uh, dynamic updates use symmetric keys, which are much more difficult to handle. But there are methods to do it with asymmetric keys that, that actually uh, work in this case. So that's not been published yet. I know that UN is about to write another one of these draft documents about that. Uh, uh, it hasn't happened yet. And I don't think ICANN has even published the, the, the slides from that, uh, uh, from that uh, symposium yet, but that 
is uh, in in the in the works. I know. So uh, stay tuned. That was what I was going to tell you about today. Any questions, remarks, rotten tomatoes? I can, <laughs> I can take one from here. Sure. Uh, so I was wondering about. Uh, so I saw the dynamic updates. That seemed like a better idea, but a general notification. My first reaction to that was that what a way to do an amplification attack is it uh, the, the way you present it it seemed like somebody could uh, trigger the root servers to actually start uh, pondering the child servers or, or i might have misunderstood something uh well um that's a matter of how you implement it in the parent i'd say uh because if you have rate limiting there um it will be hard if you were only allowed to ask for one update every two weeks uh, it's unlikely that that will be an application factor, but uh, it's something that you need to look into absolutely. Uh, yeah, but is there any way of securing that uh, an unauthorized uh, uh, request? Uh, like then you can block uh, block a request from uh, by uh, sending an unauthorized request, and then you're blocking it for two weeks or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, reflection attacks are are you know something that we deal with every day. So. Yes, this every DNS transaction is is uh, vulnerable to that in some way. Yes, uh, so it's something that you will have to build into this system. Obviously, you are quite right. Or protection against that is probably the right phrase. A small question about the uh, DNS sec and your opinion on um, the um, poisoning of DNS by uh, third parties that are. Uh, trying to hijack connections. What's your view on that? Uh, to me, DNSSEC helps a lot with, with uh, assuring that the DNS information that you as a client get is the correct one. Um, the cache poisoning problem is where someone else managed to put um, records that, that general users want to look up, uh, but with the wrong information in the resolver, which is on the the help server on the client side. Uh, so if they manage to trick that resolver into storing a record where the IP address for your bank is not the correct IP address, then the clients who ask for that information will be vulnerable. But with DNSSEC, the resolver is able to validate the content of the DNS information before giving it out to others. And DNSSEC is very, very efficient in helping there. Uh, that's, I would say, is the primary reason for going with DNSSEC, is to uh, to avoid that problem. But it's not really a question of tricking. It's more like the government has, uh, uh, by law, required that you are going to poison DNS. If you are looking at popcorntime.com, I think uh, you will get a different answer here in Norway. If you are looking for some services, the uh, ISPs are required to... Uh, poison DNS and return something else okay. or uh, gambling services and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I see your point. And so that's that's uh, uh, something where you as an end user still have the tools to validate. If DNSSEC is being used in, in, in all this, uh, in the entire chain from, from the root down to this, this service, uh, it could be that the resolver has a legal obligation to put something else in but if you are really interested in this, you as an end client can actually do the full validation yourself, and then you will detect that. Uh, but it does require that you operate your equipment with the DNSSEC validation turned on, and there are very few and far between people that do that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but yes, it is possible. So the tool is there. Uh, it's uh, maybe it's 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 slightly too complicated to actually use the tool. But we on the provisioning side cannot really do more than providing tools to to validate things. We cannot run the validation for you. Oh, please wait for microphone, please. Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, in 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 those keys, uh, I haven't noticed any description of the signing algorithm. So which algorithms are are supported? Well, you, you mentioned RSA, but what about elliptic curves? Yeah. What about post quantum crypto? Uh, uh, I'm I haven't really you know dived into the post quantum 
part of things yet, but the, the algorithms that are currently used for, for uh, DNS signing in, in some, to some extent is uh, old, old, the old system, uh, people who, who want traditional stuff, they use RSA. Uh, and uh, more recently, people have started to shift towards uh, elliptic curve with the DSA because that's uh, much more efficient. One thing that we worry about with, with the DNS is the size of the packets, because you want DNS to be you know, small units of information that you can send quickly, because it's something that, it's a precursor to almost every connection on the internet. So it's something that be, needs to be really fast, and we don't want to overload the network with you know bloat. Uh, since it's very small pieces of information, we want to keep the signature small as well. and sorry, elliptic curve really helps you there. Uh, and then the third one is GOSHT, uh, which is a Russian uh, system that's been standardized. And there are some legal requirements on the Russian side of things that they have to use these algorithms. So they, there is actually a standard for that as, as well. And, and uh, so that is being used. Those are the three major ones. Hi. So maybe it was on one of your final slides, you skipped one of them a bit quickly, but what happens if like you as a parent, when you update your key, yeah. do you then sign all your child's keys immediately or how does that work and how much time would... Uh, okay, uh, if I as a child want, you know, this gets complicated quickly and now we're getting into the dragons So I warned you about. <laughs> we, are, we are now leaving the tourist safe area. <laughs> So actually, every zone has two keys, one that it gets signed from above, from the parent, uh, with the DS record that I mentioned, and the second one is used for signing all the records in your zone, and then your first key signs the second key. Uh, there are administrative reasons for this, because it turns into a nightmare if, if, uh, if you have, oh, what was it? Uh, there is a situation where the parent can suddenly get into a position of having to sign all the children's keys at once if you're not careful. Um, uh, so by splitting it into two keys, you can replace one at a time. Uh, and and uh, uh, that turns the administration into something doable as opposed to something impossible. Um, anyhow, when you rotate a key, either of these, uh, if you rotate your zone signing key, the lower key here, you can add a new key and then you sign all your records with first the first one and then the second one, which will create, you have the normal address record and you have an RRSIG record for that, but now you will have two RRSIG records while you rotate. And then eventually you will take out the old key and sign again with only the remaining one key. Now in every of these steps, when you add a key, you have to sign with your upper key, all the keys that you have in, in operation further down. Uh, but that's a small thing because you do that with your equipment. So add, if you add a key down here, sign the key set, all, all the keys together, uh, sign the zone with both keys. Eventually, sometime later, you remove the first keys, sign the key set, and then with the, the remaining key, you sign all the zones. Oh, sorry, all, all the records in your zone. If you replace your key signing key at the top, you add another one, and now you have to go to your parent and say, I have two keys. So you have two DS records that are signed by your parent. And then you sign both your keys with both your, both your zone signing, oh, sorry, your zone signing key with both your, your key signing keys. And then eventually, you remove the old key, you talk to your parent, and you sign your uh, your zone signing key with your key signing key. So the, every every rotation is a two step thing, but by decoupling these, we don't have to sign the entire zone when we replace this key, and we don't have to have the uh, the uh, the parent do more work than necessary. But it's you know interaction to the parent is the thing we want to avoid or automate. And that's why the CDS record uh, has been invented. Uh, 
Uh, can we make this the last question? We're running a little bit late, so I'm just sure this is the last question afterwards. Can you approach Lehman directly? Yes. Because we'll take a short break, uh, 10, 15 minutes, and then you, you, you can ask Lehman questions directly, but please go ahead. A quick one then. Uh, you mentioned that you are running DNS and NTP. Have you considered also running trusted timestamping? Uh, yes, have... we do. We uh, uh, sorry, uh, we do we uh, time stamping. Uh, yes, we have considered that. We do have a secure NTP service, so you can get signed time from us. Uh, different, but that's that's a different thing. Uh, so yes, we've been been talking about that, but we are not there yet. That'd be very nice. Thanks. So uh, thank you. I hear that we are uh, going for refreshments. <laughs> yes, thank you, Liman, and. For everyone, please help yourself here. And uh, we're starting in about, about 10, 15 minutes again. Yep. And I'll be around here for the entire evening. So I'm uh, happy to take questions.
it on to David to introduce the next speaker. And here we go. Okay. Thank you, Steinar. Okay, so we have a yeah. totally different presentation now. This is the one I'm very excited about Hello. Uh, because we're going to talk about how it all goes wrong. And to talk about how it all goes wrong is our new friend Tor. Tor is the principal consultant at Mnemonic AS. Mnemonic is a cybersecurity company based in Oslo. Tor, please. Thank you. Thank you. Is the sound okay? So first of all, thanks everybody for coming. And I'm <clears throat> I'm here to talk about real world crypto mistakes. And so who am I to talk about this? Uh, like that it's good okay thanks so i've been do i've been doing cybersecurity since uh 2006 started out doing crypto research uh for the last uh, 13 years i've been doing a little bit of everything a little bit of red teaming a little bit of security architecture some security audits and some some blue team yeah so I guess not all of you are familiar with Mnemonic. For those who don't know us, we are the largest cybersecurity company in the Nordics. We're about, I think, 350 people now. We do managed de detection response. We do, we, we do instant response services. Um, we work with security products and system integration and also do some consulting. Um, some of you might have been, might be familiar with the recent zero day vulnerabilities in, in Ivanti EPMM, uh, but that story is for a different talk because today we're going to talk about crypto. And so a little bit of motivation. So modern cryptography is a discipline with less than 50 years of history. So the ball really got rolling in the mid 1970s with the Diffie-Hellman and RSA and also the, also the data encryption standard DES. And in the early years, there was uh, quite a bit of innovation and evolution, but also quite a few dead ends. And I think it's only over the last 10, 15 years that we've started to reach some degree of technical maturity with core primitives that are pretty stable and where we know how to use them and combine them, at least in theory. So uh, in 2008, uh, there was the MD5 considered harmful today paper where they broke MD, the MD5 algorithm using a cluster of 200 PlayStations. Uh, and in 2017, we got the first collisions on the SHA-1 hash function. But if you look at the kind of core crypto primitives today, they're pretty they're pretty solid. So, which means that a lot of current research is looking at stuff like quantum and kind of things that are not quite immediately as problematic. However, somehow practice is a lot harder than theory. So can everybody who's recently sent an encrypted email using GPG please raise their hands? Uh, there are a few hands, in fact, uh, not very many. Um, it turns out that kind of doing this in practice is a lot harder than it should be right and so i think also we should try to have a little bit of fun so i'm, I'm going to try to keep this pretty lighthearted and, and 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 simple and not dive too deeply into the into the weeds so some since this is my talk i get to be a little bit opinionated opinionated and hear some of my pet peeves and so one of the things that really annoys me is kind of the grat gratuitous cryptography that only adds complexity and doesn't really solve anything. And I've also had the pleasure of dealing with some very broken cryptographic uh, schemes where it turns out that the bulletproof crypto somehow relies on a weak password or an unpatched server or lost key. Oops. And there is a lot of great crypto research out there. There's a lot of good theory. The difficult part is making this thing work consistently in practice at scale. And this is actually why the previous talk on DNSSEC, I think that stuff is really cool because it's one of the examples of people doing something that's actually pretty complicated and with crypto and making it work. 
Anyway, I'm going to talk about three main topics today where we see that crypto fails. And the first one, this is a quote by Robert Mor Morris Sr., who was a chief scientist at the NSA in the 80s and 90s. He also wrote the original password hash hashing algorithm for Unix. And at Crypto95, he said, rule number one of cryptanalysis, check for plain text. And that's kind of what it boils down to. If you, a lot of the time, going around the crypto is much easier than breaking it. And so you want to check for plain text. And I guess some people have seen this slide from the Snowden files, which is an example of the NSA basically following Robert Morris's advice, look for plain text. So the encryption goes away here. And so you really clear text traffic going between the data centers on the back end. And I think the Snowden revelations pissed off a lot of people quite, quite rightfully. And uh, from what I know, Google started encrypting their cross data center traffic pretty, pretty quickly after this thing came out. And my understanding is that they actually implemented encryption on the application layer to get to make it really end to end. And in most organizations I've seen, that would have been really hard because doing it doing it on the application level layer tends to add a lot more complexity than doing it on, for example, point to point traffic. So, well, anyway, non crypto. Here's another example of non crypto. Base64 encryption. You would be surprised at the amount of interesting stuff I found that's been Base64 encrypted. Uh, and the joke is, of course, that Base64 is not secure and not cryptography. Uh, another fun one. This uh, is a vulnerability in in, uh, in Microsoft's Kerberos Key Distribution Center service in Windows. And so I guess what's imp I guess the details don't really matter, but what's important to know is that the, the, the Kerberos service is the one that issues tickets to kind of access other stuff. So it's a little bit important. And of course, if you're asking this service for a ticket to go somewhere, you need to authenticate those requests, right? Uh, so the fun thing here was that th this was the bug that uh, the service would accept any algorithm that was provided by the underlying crypto library, uh, including uh, CRC32, which again is not crypto. So you could uh, basically forge a ticket uh, request by signing it with CRC32, which is which was kind of bad at the time. Uh, you do have a very similar version of this, which uh, happened when JSON web tokens were new, and you could you could you, you could make a token using the null signature scheme because RFC seventy five nineteen allows you to set algorithm none, and uh, most JWT libraries check this now, but at some point they didn't, and so you could basically. Uh, make your own tokens and not sign them and have them accepted, which was kind of fun. So I think I've kind of beaten this point a little bit to death. So so what do you do here? Uh, well, if you want to use proper crypto, you need to actually know what you want to accomplish and, and where you do need to use crypto and make sure that you're actually doing that. And I think a second point is that you should take a few steps back and look at your threat model every so often to make sure that your assumptions actually remain valid and that suddenly you don't have, for example, quantum computers that can break all your old crypto. So this is a pretty common crypto fail, not using crypto. The next category I'm going to talk about is what happens when you start rolling your own. So you see that you need to do crypto and 
you do some crypto-ish stuff and it kind of works, you think? Uh, but it's put together in a bit strange way and it might not actually be as secure as you think it is supposed to be. So there was, there was this essay a few years ago, uh, which where the main premise was that if you have to type the letters AES into your source code, then you're doing something wrong. And I think kind of the main thing here is that if you're typing the letters AES into your source code, uh, the advanced encryption standard, then you're you're getting into very, very deep water very quickly. And most of the time, what you want to be doing, you want to have confidentiality, you want to have integrity, you want, you want to have all these kind of higher order uh, crypto functionalities for your service doing whatever. You don't want to do kind of crypto plumbing uh, and, and implement the low level details. Uh, unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of the time anyway. So one kind of big problem in my, from my point of view is that you have a lot of libraries that offer low level a crypto APIs that kind of provide any kind of algorithm that you might want to use. So the problem is that uh, you need to assemble it and you probably don't have a PhD in cryptographic engineering uh, to do so. In fact, I have a PhD in cryptographic engineering and I don't want to do it. So, and so what we, what I see happen all the time is that people try to build stuff and the assembly kind of works out like, uh, like the play table and chair. So, and to, to, to use another metaphor. So as Fede Bakudu explains it in martial arts classes around the world, the master demonstrates how you should do it. And the student watches and the student copies and the student gets the left and right mixed up. And, and basically if you have four degrees of freedom, then you have one way to do it right and 15 ways to do it wrong. So the odds here are not in your favor. Most likely there's going to be something that's not in the right position, some option that has the wrong value and you don't know this and who can blame you? So basically, Correctly building high level crypto functionalities is hard. Uh, the operational, operationalization bit is where things keep failing in practice. And the development of TLS is uh, a kind of good example. So the standardization process for TLS 1.3 in IETF took about five years from beginning to end. And that it really didn't happen overnight. There was a lot of discussion and a lot of back and forth and very smart people spent a lot of time modeling everything regarding TLS 1.3 to, to make it secure. And they more or less succeeded. There hasn't been any significant protocol levels, level attacks on TLS 1.3 in the last five years. But even in 2023, we're still trying to pull the plug on TLS 1.0 from 1999. So these things hang around, hang around for a long time. And as it turned out, uh, TLS 1.0 was a pretty good attempt in 1999, but we do know a lot more today than we knew then. I'll give just one small technical example to kind of illustrate Again, the point of how hard it is to put these things together correctly. And I've used I've used this example a few times before because it's uh, it's not very recent. But uh, so basically here is some Java code that does some crypto and there are some bugs in it. But what's wrong here? Does, does anybody have any ideas? So there might be multiple things wrong here. I'll just walk through uh, a few of them. So at least there's the PBE, the password-based encry encryption. This has a parameter that sets a kind of security level to slow down brute force attacks on the passwords. And in the code, they use uh, the parameter, parameter two in the function call. 
and an appropriate value when this code was written would be a hundred thousand. And today, I think best practice is something like six six hundred thousand because brute force attacks have kind of speeded up over time. So, so that's a bug because it basically it basically means that it's uh, fifty thousand times faster to brute force the passwords than it should be. And then uh, the in the IV the initialization vector is a fixed string, and when you're using uh, AES in in CFB mode with a fixed IV, then you're basically leaking leaking information about at least the first sixteen bytes of data from your ciphertext. And if uh, and it also means that if your plain text has a certain statistical distribution, for example, if your your plain text is regular text, then you might be able to decrypt completely based on st statistical analysis. And so, arguably, there are a few more things wrong here, like using AES in CFB mode. Come on, who uses CFB mode? And shouldn't you actually be using authenticated encryption instead? And arguably, you shouldn't be using PPKDF2 because even though that's standardized, that's not really what, what's recommended. And arguably, using the Bouncy Castle library for Java, which is basically, has, it, Bouncy Castle has been described as basically this zoo where you can go and watch all the strange crypto algorithms which you shouldn't be using. Uh, my take on this is actually that the mistake here is having to deal with this code in the first place. Because uh, owning and maintaining and being responsible for this code carries a significant load. And in most cases, that's a mistake. You don't want to do it. So moving to the attacker perspective, uh, there will be bugs. And what should you be doing? What should you be doing? I think for 95% of use cases, you should try to keep things simple and and look for a high level library that's been tested and proven and fits with what you're trying to be doing. And then for the, for those last cases, make sure that there's enough time and resources available to to make it properly solid. And so, where this becomes kind of difficult is where there is not any appropriate libraries available. And I think too often that's still the case, but there are some good ones out there, and you should at least look for that first. So going to my final topic, this, uh, you, even if you, even if you are using crypto and even if you're using an implementation that's sound, uh, you might still be using something that's outdated or misconfigured. Uh, this is an example from SSL labs using badssl.com, which is a nice resource that can be used to test server misconfigurations. And kind of the basic problem here is that good old attacks are still with us. So every, uh, every attack that somebody has thought up over the years uh, basically still applies and they only get better over time. So the AES CBC padding oracle attack, for example, uh, was first published 20 years ago. And it's still a great source of high impact vulnerabilities today. Uh, in short, what it does is that in a situation where you have a CBC padding oracle, uh, an attacker will be able to decrypt and modify encrypted data in your application. Uh, and that is a problem if that data is either confidential or trusted. And there are pretty good ways to avoid this, like using authentic authenticated encryption and not using AES-CBC. But this is this one technique is still kind of it will get you a lot of bug bounties if you if you know it and look for it. And so the flip side of the old attacks is that uh, best practices are moving forward. So a lot of the good old stuff from the 80s and 90s should be uh, retired. Uh, 
for example, I'm I'm on the I'm on the record on the internet saying that RC4 is the best cipher suit to use with DLS. And at the time I said it, uh, that was absolutely absolutely the case. But that was ten years ago, and it's not the case anymore. So, Ron Rivest, the the R in RSA, invented both RC4 and MD5, and they were great algorithms. They had a good run, and they're not useful anymore. And so it turns out that modern crypto practices and standards do eliminate a lot of these old attack classes. And authenticated encryption is a, is a really good example of that. So when, when people talk about encryption, you think about confidentiality first and foremost, that you, you encrypt something so that people can't read it. But it turns out that you get a lot of really interesting attacks which are enabled by the, by having an attacker who is able to modify or tamper or, or change data, even if it's encrypted. And so what you want to be using is really authenticated en encryption where you have an additional mechanism to avoid tampering. And there are really nice standards for that and you should be using it instead of AES-CBC, for example. So this happened to me last week. So Raise, again, raise hands if this ever happened to you. The code hasn't been updated and developer quits. This is not just a crypto problem. This is a software security problem, but it certainly applies to crypto code as well. And again, I mean, what, what, what I do see is that if you, you can't just kind of implement the crypto and put it over there and let it sit there for 10 years. It has to be maintained. You, 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 do, need to, you, do, you do need to install patches. You do, do need to make changes. You do, you do need to version and standardize your configuration and not just the code. So wrapping, wrapping up, we, we've had a quick look at kind of three ways that crypto fails in practice. So there is a little bit of a silver lining at the end here. Um, it turns out that a lot of threat actors also don't do, know how to do operational secure crypto. I've seen a few cases where basically crypt, poor crypto skills has been very helpful when we do, we've been doing instant response. So there's something at least. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. And do we have time for some questions? Hi, thanks. That was a brilliant talk. Really interesting. Um, uh, do you have a solution? Yeah, <laughs> solutions. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of back to back to some of the stuff we've been looking at here. Like, yeah, you need to you need to keep things maintained. Uh, uh, you need to. Use established standards. Use high-level li libraries. Try to try to avoid going too deeply into the cryptographic weeds because this is this is not really your goal, right? Your 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 goal is to provide some functionality in a secure way and doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, being resilient to to attacks, uh, and then. Most most of the time, I think uh, being able to leverage sta standards, being able to build on on kind of solid building blocks like TLS one three, like DNSSEC, whenever possible. That's good. Uh, going all the way back to the, going all the way back to my starting hypothesis. Um, yeah, uh, make sure that, I mean, cri crypto is one, it gives you a nice box of tools, but you don't want to do crypto just to do crypto. You want to do crypto to accomplish something. So make sure that kind of whatever you're doing actually aligns with your goals, basically. 
and make sure that you think about implementation and operations and not just kind of this looks nice. All right, uh, question over here. Oh, I try to speak English. Uh, do you have uh, an, an examples of uh, of uh, lousy used crypto? Uh, of course, there are many example examples, but do you have examples that you would like to mention due to lousy use of cryptation of the examples you have mentioned? <clears throat> Stupid question, Sam. Yeah, no, I mean it's a, I mean it's a good question. I think um, I I think this is the kind of key one. Uh, there are so, there are so many examples where you you defeat the security not by breaking the crypto but by reading the plain text wherever it's available. Uh, so it's not really an example of lousy crypto, but I don't know if people read the basically Microsoft's blog post about how their signing key was compromised this summer, where basically um, the signing key had been embedded in a crash dump and they didn't spot that, and then they exported the crash dump to a different, a, a less secure system, and then somebody broke into that and found it, and and basically there, there was this whole chain of events, which kind of at each step seemed a little bit implausible, but then in the end this actually happened, and the key leaked, and somebody used it in an attack, and it's boiled down to basically plain text, and then from the attacker perspective, being able to find the plain text and then utilize it. So not really answering the question, but I think this is really this is really the most fundamental bit that if you if in fact you are use if in fact you need cryptography for security, then you need to be also very careful around the edges where you don't have cryptography. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, so um, I have uh, people I work with in different situations, like open source and colleagues and forum colleagues and friends in open source communities and stuff. Um, and I see that uh, thinking of security is something people try, many of them try to avoid. Yeah. So I'm think, asking myself here, uh, Part of the solution here has to be around motivating people to start thinking of these things in a sensible way. Do you have any like ideas and pointers or thoughts on on how to get some progress on the on this fear direction? I, I I would like to turn it a little bit upside down. I think really the best the best way to improve security is to try to make it so frictionless that most people don't have to care about the details because it is in fact handled. Uh, I think I, I think if the overall security of the ecosystem is reliant on a lot of people being very aware and very alert at all times, that's going to be tough to then it's going to be tough to succeed. Um, Take uh, take phishing as an example. Uh, phishing is one of those techniques that's always going to work because you are using you are operating within the boundaries of the system and using it as intended. Basically, if you send if you send CVs to HR, if you send invoices to to finance, people are gonna people are gonna click on it because it's their job to click on it, and so. Your protection on your protection against those attacks can't be reliant on kind of people not clicking. Uh, and I think that mindset kind of transfers to a lot of different contexts that you have to build your systems in a way that uh, where doing the secure thing is easy. All right, <clears throat> great. Thank you so much, Tor.
And this is a gift for you. Thanks for coming and joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we have one final talk, and this is going to be very different, and it's going to be from me. And what's really, really interesting about this is I'm not a cryptographer. I don't know very much about cryptography. And yet here I am standing in front of you in, in uh, a conversation about cryptography because I do have something very interesting to say. But I want to start by talking together a little bit about the internet. When I graduated from university, my first, my training and my first job was actually in broadcast engineering. I was a TV engineer, okay? And when I graduated and I got a job producing a television show, my mother was very happy because when people said, oh, what is David doing now? He graduated, yes, he works in TV. He puts on this show. And my mother liked that because she could tell everybody what I did and she was proud of that, okay? And in 1999, I changed jobs, I changed careers, and I went to work for Aaron, the IP address registry for North America. And that meant I was helping manage IP addresses. Now, my mother was born in 1945. And in 1999, she had no idea what that meant. It's 2023 and I'm still not entirely sure she knows what that means. But for the last 24 years, I haven't really been able to explain to my mother what it is I do. And that's, again, because she was born in 1945. And at that time, the most advanced technology in her house was a radio. And later, in her teenage years, it was a television. And then it got cool. The television became color. And it wasn't until she was in her 60s that she started using every day the internet. And she got, you know, she had a laptop, she had a desktop at her, at her work. But what really made this thing alive for her was when she got her smartphone in the late 2000s or the early 2010s. And it was really interesting for me <clears throat> as someone who grew up with computers to watch my mother on her phone because what we like to do is we like to play Scrabble, right? The word game, putting together words. But my mother tried to play it with me on her phone and she couldn't. And the reason she couldn't is because when she used her finger to try and move the tiles from her rack to the board, she didn't understand intuitively how to push down on the screen and drag it up and move it to the right spot. She didn't have that skill. It was something completely new to her. So she starts to learn this whole internet thing and she starts to ask me more and more. And the best question she ever asked is, I don't get how this works. I don't get that how I can just sit in my living room in New York, in the United States, and I can talk to anybody around the world and it works the same for everybody. Whether you're in Moscow, whether you're in Oslo, whether you're in Johannesburg, no matter where you are, the whole thing works. And it's really interesting if you think about that. Why does it work? Why is the internet essentially the same for everyone? We'll, we'll ignore a little bit about governmental content controls or your, your, the company you work for, blocking sites. We'll ignore that just a little bit. For the most part, underlying it all works the same. And why is that? Well, there are a couple answers to that, but the answer I'm focused in on right now is interoperability. We all speak the same language. We all have the same, we've all adopted the same standards and we've adopted them voluntarily. Now that's interesting. And I also think that's really kind of cool because I'm here in Norway. I don't live in Norway. I live in the United States. So what does that mean when I get here? My plugs don't work. The charger for my Mac, the charger for my phone. Countries around the world have decided we're not going to standardize on plugs. We're not going to standardize on the voltages and the shapes of the plugs, which means every time we travel to different countries, we have to bring adapters with us. <laughs> <laughs> I 
They standardized indeed a lot. Um, when we use our cell phones and we talk to each other over SMS, some of us get a blue message, and some of us get a green message. Because these things, which are super, super important to most of us in this world, we can't even use the same standards to talk to each other on the application layer, right? But we are using the same standards to build internet. It's a voluntary thing, right? The standards, for the most part, the internet standards are developed at the IETF, and people adopt the standards that they like. Not all the standards at the IETF are used. Not all of them are good. In fact, a lot of them stick. They're stupid. But the ones that aren't stupid or the ones that actually have utility, everyone's chosen to adopt. And the reason they've chosen to adopt is because they want everybody be, to be able to use their thing or they want all their users to be able to go use your thing. And the only way that works is if we use the same standards. Now, in order for everything that my mother and everything that all of us do on the internet, in order for it to work, there are two standards really that the whole thing is built atop. BGP for routing, the whole thing relies on the standard that was finalized in 1995 by a guy named Yakov Rector at IBM. Uh, we had created this thing called BGP to, to, to exchange routing information across different networks. It didn't scale very well. And in 1995, we came up with version four of it and it solved all sorts of scaling problems. Now it is <clears throat> uh, almost 30 years later and we're using the same standard today at a much, much bigger scale than we ever were in the 1980s and the 1990s. We're still using it, it's BGP. But the other thing that we need to make sure all of this works is the DNS. Now, Lehman, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't supposed to be like that. DNS is just an application, okay? It's nothing special, except it is, because when it was invented in 1983 to solve problems, some very small scale scaling problems with email and with, with uh, sharing how the information was distributed about names. Um, the gentleman who created it, Paul Makapetras, I think very accidentally solved what I think is the most difficult problem to solve there is in computer science, which is scaling. This thing scales infinitely, especially these days with the cheapness of memory, the cheapness of processing, and just the general, the raw amount of computing power we have in this world, we can't outscale the DNS. We can't outrun the DNS. It's just, it scales. So it's used, it works. So people use it and they try and jam all sorts of things into it. Okay, fine. But at its core, when you open up your application on a phone, when you go to a, on a web browser, whatever it is you do, Sometimes it's badging into the badging through these doors. Use the DNS. In one way, it's really stupid. We shouldn't be overloading a simple application to do everything like open a door or to get into a bathroom or something. On the other hand, we do it because it works and we do it because it scales. And that makes the DNS a very, very fundamental part of how we use the internet. So what is my point to this whole thing? Well, Lehman talked to us earlier about the trust anchor, the root trust anchor, because in the DNS, so many of the names in it are signed. They're cryptographically signed, the DNS sec keys. And those keys are validated. And if that doesn't work, if that somehow fails, all sorts of things break on the internet, like badly. You can't go to a whole lot of sites and you can't do a whole lot of things. So at the root of this entire system is the trust anchor. And these keys turn out to be super, super important. And that's what I want to talk about today. Not the keys themselves. I want to talk about how we secure these keys. So there's a lot of, a lot of press out there, a lot of marketing that talk about seven keys to the internet. There's seven people in the whole world who hold the keys to the root, to the signing key of the root zone, which makes them the seven people with the keys to the internet. Well, there are seven people. There's actually seven people times two. And then there's seven people times two behind that with backup keys. But there are seven people who hold one physical safety deposit box key 
And inside that safety deposit box are credentials, which if you were used together would enable the operation of a hardware device, which generates signatures. So let me explain. I'm gonna skip past these slides because we've already talked about them, but we are talking about the private key that is used to sign all the, to sign the next level key, to sign the zone uh, that gets us at the very top of the hierarchy. And in order to keep this thing safe, so that nobody can get at it, so it's not found in a dump file somewhere. We need special procedures. We need special procedures to keep it secure. So, whoa, skip ahead there. So how do we secure it? We're going to do level upon level upon level of security abstraction. And the first level we have is the hardware security module. Now, hardware security modules take lots of shapes. They have lots of different, uh, there's lots of different manufacturers. They have different software and again, different physical forms. But that's what our HSMs look like. And as I said, you know, the purpose of the HSM is to secure these things. Um, the device itself is tamper proof. And what I mean by that is if you have physical access to the device, if you try and mess with it to try and get inside of it, it falls. And once it falls, it can't be used again. If you try and take it and put it in your car, it's going to fault. It has sensors. The whole thing is that when you take out an HSM, you're careful with it, you put it on a table, you quietly use it, and you put it back. Because if you don't, it will literally self-destruct. To get to the contents of the HSM, to get to the secure key, you need a smart card. What we've done is we've broken up the key into seven different smart cards. And you need three of them in order to turn this thing on and actually use it. And so what we do is we give these seven smart cards to seven different people. These people are part of a trusted community. We have a process that's well vetted by the community. And the community is everybody who wants to be involved. We have a process by which we select individual human beings to be one of these seven trusted community representatives. These are people who you know, or people who experts in the community know. Here in Scandinavia, we have two experts from the region uh, one is named Pia Gruvo. She is a 28-year military cryptographer for the government of Sweden, a recognized expert who has been keeping secrets for her government for a very long time. Um, the other one is Christian Orman from Internet Stiefelsen, uh, who used to uh, run .dk and now runs .se. This is a person well-known in DNS circles. Um, so Pia and uh, Christian have some of these smart cards. And again, as I said, in order to access these keys, when we want to use the keys to sign other keys, we have to bring everybody together into a ceremony, which means we actually have to have physically everybody together because the, each of these people owns the safety deposit box key, the physical key that allows you access to here. Let me explain. We have a safe, a very big, heavy safe. And inside the safe is the HSM. And there are only two people in the world who know the combination to the safe. And we change the combinations periodically. There's only two people. And the safe, again, is monitored. It has seismic monitors and other sensors that will alarm if someone tries to get into the safe. There's also another safe sitting right next to it. I'll show you pictures in a minute. We put the smart cards inside the second safe, but the second safe has safety deposit boxes inside of it. There are safes within the safe. And the only thing that the trusted community representative holds on their physical person hidden somewhere is the key, the physical key to get into one of the safety deposit boxes. But that's not enough. I hold the other key. A couple of trusted employees of the organization, of which I'm one, have the second key. You need both keys 
to get just like a regular safety deposit box, right? Okay, so two physical keys to get into the safety deposit box to get one of the smart cards that's only one part of the seven, which is inside of a safe, which is a different safe with a different combination and different two other, the two people who know the combination are different than the two people who know the other combination, okay? Those safes are in a cage. You can't get into that cage unless you have the right number of people who have biometric iris detectors and have a smart card of their own to just badge in and have a multi-digit code. So in order to get to the smart cards to enable the HSM, and you have to get to the HSM, you have to get through a door that needs two people with the right biometrics, the right security code, and the right passcode to get to the safe that the combination is only known by two people, and you need two safes, and then you need the other keys. So there's a lot of security there, but that's not enough. That cage is located in a room which has two doors, an inner door and an outer door. In order to get through the inner door to get to the bigger room, once again, you need two people with the correct biometrics, the correct smart card, and the correct combinations to get into the door. To get through the outer door, you need a physical key, just a regular key that you can put into a door. Okay, not the safest thing, except they're inside a data set. And I don't mean they're inside a data center. I mean they're inside of a data center that you can't find because it's not on a map. And the data center is guarded by men and women with guns because we're America. But seriously, they're guns. When you walk into this, I'm not a huge fan of guns, okay? That's just me. But when I walk into this facility, everybody's carrying a gun. These are people who are licensed and entrusted by our government and the corporation they work for to physically guard the data center from intrusion. And they have guns that they'll use to shoot with, God forbid. We've put two of these facilities, KMF, Key Management Facility. We've created two of these facilities that are in the United States for now. Maybe one day they won't be in the United States. One of them is in a place called Culpeper, Virginia. Virginia is where I happen to live. To get to Culpeper, you fly into our big airport, Dulles Airport, and then you get into a car and you drive to the middle of nowhere for about two hours. Then you drive an hour past that. It's in the absolute middle of nowhere. It's beautiful, beautiful country, hills, grass, trees, and it's really, really nice. But don't be hungry because there's nothing to eat out there. You're in the middle of nowhere in these secure bunkers, and one of those bunkers happens to have this data center and this data center is guarded by the men and women with the guns, and you they need all sorts of keys to get in. We've replicated the whole thing on the west side of the country of the United States in a place called El Segundo. El Segundo is just a neighborhood in Los Angeles, but that's actually kind of safe by itself because it's an urban setting. There's a lot of buildings in Los Angeles. It's really, really dense. You have to find the unmarked building that's not on the map to get inside. And then of course there's men and women with guns. So we're at the end here. We're just gonna talk a little bit about what these key ceremonies look like. So what happens is about four times a year, all of these trusted community representatives and the people who have at least one person who has the combination to each safe, so two people, and the people who have the cards and the, the, the correct eyes, the correct irises to get in, they all show up. We all show up physically in the same location. And we need enough people in order to conduct the ceremony. The purpose of the ceremony is to sign new keys, right? It's not to sign the key signing key itself. We keep that static for many years because all of the DNS resolvers around the world know and understand that key. So we keep that for a few years before we roll that over. We use it to sign other keys. And so we need a whole lot of people. But it's not just the people in the room because how do you know you can trust the people in the room? Well, the whole thing is broadcast. The whole thing is broadcast online on YouTube. And if you are ever awake late at night and need to go to sleep, 
bring up one of these ceremonies in YouTube and watching it because it makes watching paint dry exciting. Um, there are some pictures here. Um, the ceremonies, it's a bunch of people in the room who are following a script. Um, there's Pia, uh, there's me. Uh, I lead some of these ceremonies when they're on the East Coast of the United States. Um, these are the safes. There's the HSM in safe one, and there are the safe, the, the smart cards are in the safety deposit boxes in safe number two. There's our HSM. You can actually see the keyboard. Um, one of the counterintuitive parts about these things is the software for the HSM does actually require some passcodes in order to take signing steps. Uh, the password's 11223344455. Because that password's not interesting. You can't get to the HSM to type in that super secret password, right? So the most difficult part of a key ceremony is I'm a big guy. I have a little bit of fat fingers. Typing 11223344455 about 100 times during a key ceremony, inevitably I fat finger it and I get it wrong and everyone goes, and I have to do it again. We follow scripts. The whole thing is scripted and the script is published beforehand and the public, the script is published afterwards. The script is public. You can literally sit there, bring up the YouTube and you can follow every step of the script. And the script is really detailed. Safe security controller one, remove the existing safe lock, show the most recent page to the audit camera. Every time we're in the cage and we do things, we, hold them up to a camera inside the cage so everyone online can see exactly what it is. The internal witness then provides the pre-printed safe log to Safe Security Controller 1. Safe Security Controller 1 writes the date and time, then signs the safe log. They verify the entry, they initial it. I mean, literally, if you breathe, it better be on the script. The purpose of the script, again, is to engender trust because we're talking about a key that everyone on the internet needs to work and to not be compromised. We can't screw it up. Because I can't explain to my 70 year old, eight year old mother, oh yeah, we screwed up and now you can't do anything for a few weeks. She's not gonna be happy with me. But seriously, we can't screw it up. So the whole thing, the whole purpose of these ceremonies, the, whole, uh, the way they're designed is to engender trust that we're doing the right thing as I can. We are doing the right thing as a DNS community. The trusted community representatives are doing the right thing. And then just uh, the mechanics of it all, we're keeping everything safe and we're keeping everything secure. Um, I talked about the process, it's, it's streamed, it's recorded. Uh, and then we put the whole thing up on a web page afterwards. And you can watch Ceremony 51 is coming up next uh, in November. All the previous 50 ceremonies are on the IANA.org website for you to view. And that's it. Those are the kind of absurd, but kind of cool, but kind of fun, but mostly good way that we secure cryptographic keys in the real world to make sure that everything works the way it's supposed to work. That's it. Any questions for David? Sure. So, uh... Just uh, one one thing I was wondering uh, about here in, I mean, we're in Europe. I'm sorry, your mother probably know what the pram is, but for you, I'm, I'm going to explain it. It's some sort of car that can take multiple people. You would probably call it a car, but uh, we call it a pram factor, which is uh, the amount of people that could uh, die in an accident and uh, things would still work. So I see that you have three out of seven, but what kind of considerations are done with respect to uh, securing uh, contra uh, the danger of people be becoming unavailable? Somehow? So one of the trusted community representatives was Dan Kaminsky. You all know Dan. Dan died in his mid forties, unexpectedly. And what's, What's interesting about this process is we've kind of over-engineered it. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way, actually, but it's really, really heavily engineered. I've just shown you all that, right? When we've been doing this since 2010, so we've been doing this for 13 years. And you know what the one thing we didn't consider in any of our processes was? What happens when somebody dies? 
And the problem, it depends on your jurisdiction, but Dan lived in the United States and we didn't have the legal authority to take the key back from him. He was dead, but the key was in his possession. So the key was in his home somewhere. We didn't have the legal authority to take the key back. So we have lawyers and those lawyers went through the court system. And a few months later, we got the physical key back. And what we figured out since then is it's really important if you have one of these keys that you need to tell somebody that you have one of these keys. You need to tell your spouse, you need to tell your child, you can tell your lawyer, you can tell your banker, tell somebody you trust, hey, I have this key. It's super important to the internet. If I die, a company called ICANN is going to contact you somehow. And they're going to ask you for the key back. Please give them the key back. Now, there's different ways you can do that, but it turns out to be a really important thing about holding one of these keys is you have to make plans for what happens if you die. Um, yeah, kind of on the same uh, point, like why three out of seven specifically? Like how did you decide on three out of seven? Um, I don't know the answer to your question. I don't know the answer to your question that was decided back in 2010 and we've kept that. Um, three, one of the problems is these people are all over the world and we actually have to fly them to the same location. We have to fly them to Culpeper. We have to fly them to El Segundo because they have to be in the same location. Um, you don't want too many more than three because it's hard to get people together, especially when we don't rotate too often. We're already choosing fairly senior members of the community, fairly being a fairly senior member of the community typically means you're busy, right? So it's just a matter of, in some respects, it's going to be a matter of convenience. It's hard to get everybody there. Three is a pretty good number. Maybe there could be a better number. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Yeah, uh, a little bit more about the death scenario. You yeah. talked about the keys and stuff, but I noticed uh, there was only two people who knew the combination to the safe. Yes. So isn't there a high likelihood of both of them dying and what happens then? So the safe, the physical safe has other problems. It's a mechanical device and it can and does and has in fact failed. The good news with physical safes, however, is that they're not impregnable to drills. There's all sorts of security built in to ensure that no one's messing with it in an unauthorized fashion, but nothing stops us from properly getting into the facility, properly getting into the cage, bringing in a locksmith and having them drill the locks, which we've done because sometimes the combinations don't work. Now, these things are cool. I don't have, a, I don't have one with me, but you have to prime these things. These locks, you, they're heavy. You turn them. You have to turn them at least 40 times just to turn the thing on to prime it. And then you enter the combination. And the combination isn't two to the right, one to the left, one to the right. It's actually really, really complicated. But if it fails, or if the safe security controllers aren't available and we need to get into the safe, or if they have die, we literally just drill the safe. Install a new lock, and off we go. Okay, now Tor is asking a question and now I'm officially nervous. Okay, here you go. That's fine. Yeah, just uh, following on the redundancy and, and resilience uh, line of thought here, uh, I have two uh, small questions. And the first one is what you do, how you would deal with the situation, for example, during COVID where there was mobility issues. The other one is how you deal with kind of uh, technical errors either related to the smart cards or the HSMs. So COVID, yeah, COVID really screwed us up. COVID screwed us up because we had no way of getting 
the, the trusted community representatives or the staff, by the way, the people who know the safe codes, the people who have access with the eyes and the smart cards and the codes, we had no way of bringing everybody together safely. Um, we sign keys for approximately an 18 month timeline. They have 18 month validity, the signatures. We try and rotate them every 12 months. That gives us a six month window of, uh, of padding, right? There was just enough time between the time when we stopped, Tony, what's up? Okay. There was just enough time, this one? Yeah. All right, cool. There was just enough time when we had the key ceremony in November to get us to the following April. That was April of 2021. So we lucked out a little bit on the timing. Then what we did, we didn't want to go quite that long. So what we were able to do at the 12 month mark is bring the people who are comfortable, find three of them and the staff bare bones. Okay. No other physical witnesses. We wore masks. We socially distanced everywhere. We did the best we could in a small space to keep us safe, but we had to generate new keys. Okay. So COVID was a bit of an issue and not a bit of an issue. COVID was a major issue. One of the things we were able to do is, and I'll try and make sure I'm accurate with this. Some of the TCRs were able to, the keys are kept in tamper evident bags. Okay. And we show you during the ceremonies that the tamper evident bags, we go through a procedure to show you they haven't been altered in any way. Some of the TCRs were able to take their cards and mail them to someone who was going to be there or to a staff member. And during the ceremony, we were able to show, hey, Carlos in Uruguay mailed us his key. Here's the tamper evident bag. I can verify. Nothing has touched it. It's not open. Hey, can you do that? Yes, I verified. Okay. Everyone, we see this is not tampered with. Then we open it. Then we use it. Right. Um, what was your second question? The hardware. Yes, the HSM. Well, guess what? <laughs> Earlier this year, the manufacturer of the HSMs that we chose, which are about uh, $35,000 US each, informed us that we've decided to make them end of life and we're not going to support them now. What? Now? You mean 2025, 2026? No, no, now. Uh, for business reasons, they decided to stop supporting the HSMs. That sucks. <laughs> That's a real problem because these things are expensive. These We rely on these things and we need to use these things. So now we have to go find new HSMs. So the first thing we did is we bought a whole bunch of them. We grabbed a whole bunch of the ones that were still in existence. We grabbed them. We have them. We can use them for another year or two because we think they'll be okay. They won't need support. Meanwhile, we're out there at the trade shows now trying to find FIPS 4? FIPS 4 compliance. As I understand it, that's really hard to get. So we're looking for an HSM vendor that has a FIPS 4 compliant hardware mod module and it's of the same form. It's a box. Most HSMs are a 1U or a 2U or a 4U server because you put an HSM in a rack. That's what you do with an HSM. We don't put HSMs in racks. We put them in safes. So it's not an obvious use case. So great question, very timely, very difficult to plan for. Yeah. Uh, we just had, I don't think this is working anymore. What's that? It is working. Okay, one more question. Uh, uh, yes, so uh, uh, you said that, uh, uh, so, so you come to that facility like four times a year. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, so it seems like those guards are working there, well, the whole year. It must be like the most boring work in the world. <laughs> so good question. So the guards aren't just guarding our key management facility. They're actually guarding a large million square foot data center. 
And in that data center are lots of other people. In this case, they're all US government things. This is where, this is where the secure stuff goes. But there's a lot of traffic into and out of the data center. They're not bored. Um, it's funny though, because you go to a data center to rack and stack stuff, who does it? You. Sometimes you bring a colleague because sometimes you need two of you. But for the most part, I think if you think about all the times you've gone to a data center, it's just you. You're just racking and stacking and plugging in computers and doing a couple of things, right? We don't bring one or two people to a key ceremony. We bring 20. And so all of a sudden you're sitting there, you're at the front desk, you're a guard, and all of a sudden 20 people walk in. They all want to get authenticated. We have to go through metal detectors, bag checks. It's just like going to the airport. 20 people all have to get through the front door in order to get into the data center. So for them, when we show up, it's fun because they get a lot of work to do. All right, that's the end of our uh, workshop today. Thank you all for coming. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks to our speakers, Arne Tobias, Liman, Tor, uh, and thank you all for coming out and have a wonderful day. Um, first of all, thank you, David, and thank you, Eiken, for doing this together with us, with ISO Norway. Um, I, you, you need a bottle of wine. Yeah, yeah. Well, you grab one and say hi. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, I then I no for sure I am Norsk for now. Come a little Norsk information. We have a little mat again. I offer all who have mulet to have lust to take a little bit of mat so that we can do it. The other offering is that I saw Norge needs more members. It is not difficult. Og det er helt gratis. Det eneste vi ønsker av dere er at dere gir oss et lite innspill om vad vi kan jobbe med, hvordan vi kan jobbe med det, og hva vi skal oppnå. Dere går på isop.no, der er det. Og da er dere med i det som vi håper skal være den delen som kan påvirke internet fra sluttbrukerens perspektiv. Tusen hjertelig takk for at dere kom. Ja. Jag vet att du gör reklam för ISOC, så kan jag göra reklam för ICAN. Hej, jag kommer från ICAN. Um, vi har en e-maillista för de nordiska länderna på ICAN. Om ni vill vara med på den listan, säg till mig. Jag kommer vara här. Ni får gärna vara med. Där postar vi information om till exempel sådana här händelser eller andra um, ICAN-relevanta händelser. Så vill jag bara passa på att göra lite reklam. Tack, Steiner. Ja. Okej. Okay. For this Mickey heard today, so there's beers and drinks at the scroll planner, which is what's that in English? That <laughs> that's a hard one. Yeah, yeah. Follow that guy. Yeah. And again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to ICANN. Thank you to David, Gabi, and let's meet again sometime. Cheers. <laughs>